And this like big light bulb went off in my head. I'm like, wow, I am human just like everybody else. Hello and welcome to Culture Crunch. I'm Kieran Bajar, and today we're fortunate enough to be joined by Dr. Jenny Byrne. Dr. Jenny is a founding member of Chief, as well as founder and CEO of Constellation PLLC. Constellation PLLC is a consulting and coaching company founded in 2021, aiming to bring innovation and disruption to multiple healthcare organizations. And if that wasn't enough, Dr. Jenny is also an author. Her new book, Work Smart, is being published in 2023. Dr. Jenny, welcome. Hey, Kieran. So nice to be here. Thanks for having me. It's absolutely our pleasure. How have you been? Really good. Really good. Enjoying the summer so far. Great. <laughs> and we're enjoying summer too, although today it was raining, but hey, you know, we're in London, so what to expect. <laughs> um, so Dr. Jenny, we've obviously had conversations previously regarding culture within the, the kind of professional arena. And today we're really keen to understand what that looks like through your uh, academic lens. You're very experienced in this space. So to begin, Dr. Jenny, it'd be really great to, to understand what your understanding is of uh, company culture? I love this question. Um, I think, you know, to me, if you would have asked me this question like three years ago, I would have said good company culture is about a shared mission where everybody's rowing in the same direction, everybody's aligned. Um, but now I would actually evolve that a little. And I would say that not only having common mission and being aligned, but also infusing humanism into the culture. So the culture now needs to take into account that we're not just robots, we're human beings with all of the good and bad that that brings. And the culture really needs to be attentive to us as human beings. So when talking about the future, obviously, that really incites a lot of thoughts and emotions, primarily sometimes aimed towards technology, as you discussed. So what are your thoughts then when, when people think about the future of business and they, they're, they're leaning towards technology often? What, what, what's your opinion on that? So I think this was happening pre-pandemic, but as the pandemic rolled on and people tried to learn how to work in new ways, not sitting all together in the same space, there was this realization that tech wasn't the solution to everything. So, so my premise is that the future of work, most people think about technology and how that will be good or bad. And what they're missing is, I think the future of work is about being a better human rather than where the tech is going to take us. So in terms of being a better human, what does that look like? Yeah, it's a great question. So, you know, as you know, my experience and kind of training, I've been lucky to learn how human brain and behavior works from a lot of different angles, from a neuroscience research angle, from a psychiatry medicine angle, from a psychotherapy angle. And I've learned a lot of things along the way, which really surprised me. And I've learned them about myself, too. So, for example, being a better human means understanding, being aware of yourself as a human and the people you work with and tailoring your work so that it um, is the most effective and efficient for human beings. So I can give you an example. Um, I was um, working with a patient before, a long time ago in my training, and this patient uh, was very helpless feeling in his own life. <clears throat> and very ineffective because of his, his feeling of hopelessness. So I, as a young doctor learning psychotherapy, he made me feel very helpless and hopeless just through our interactions together. But I wasn't really aware of that at a conscious level. So I would go work with my supervisor, and then I would project hopelessness and helplessness onto my supervisor. Things like I would forget to bring my notes. I would forget key details of our interactions, all these things which were really strange for me. And I didn't really understand it until the supervisor pointed it out to me and said, well, you're human 
And what you're doing is you're reflecting the emotional state of your patient onto our relationship. And this like big light bulb went off in my head. I'm like, wow, I am human just like everybody else. Here I think I'm learning all these skills, but really I'm a human being. And for me to be effective and efficient, I need to understand my human, I don't want to call them flaws because I think they're not always negative. But if I don't understand that about myself and other people, we're never going to get where we want to go. So that's kind of an example of, of how I discovered my own human frailty, perhaps in that instance and, and how it translated. And when businesses talk about programs, initiatives, steps that can be implemented in order to maximize efficiency, where do you think consideration for the human condition sits? You know, is, is that considered? Is there, is there enough space, you know, designated to think about that? Or do you think that we've got a long way to go? I think we spend a lot of time and effort thinking about operations and technology in business settings. And we spend so much time on that without accounting for the human side of things that we end up wasting our time. So for example, you know, you could have, uh, I'll take healthcare as an example, you could have the best operations in your doctor's office in the world, right? But if you're not thinking about a patient as a human being and what motivates them to make change in their lives, it doesn't matter. They're not going to do what you want them to do or what you think they should do or what's even good for them or even what they want to do because their own human psychology might be getting in the way. So you could spend you know, years optimizing operations, but if you're not accounting for the human side, it's just a waste of time. You, you talked about the psychology uh, behind these decisions. I mean, obviously mental health is, is an incredible it's always been an important factor. However, I feel that now it has more of a voice than it once did. What are the implications and the impact on mental health when talking about the lack of consideration for the human condition versus technology, in your opinion? Yeah, it's a great question. It's a little bit of a chicken and the egg in that if your mental health is not optimal, your performance at work is going to be suboptimal as well and vice versa. If work is creating negative emotional states in you, then you're going to become uh, depressed or anxious or have other difficulty, which then is going to make you even more inefficient at work. So a common example is um, anxiety, right? So like you could be an anxious person and if your anxiety is not treated, then at work you show up and you're wasting a lot of time and energy being anxious rather than actually doing your job. Or maybe you're not necessarily an anxious person, but you get that dreaded email from your boss that says, you know, we need to talk, <laughs> please call me. And that triggers a whole bunch of unnecessary anxiety in you. And then you spin your wheels on that for hours and hours waiting for your boss to call when in fact the boss really just had a simple question that wasn't really a big deal but you've imagined in your mind all these worst case scenarios and you've burned a lot of time and energy and emotion, like worrying about what the boss is going to say. So simple things like that, even like the phrasing of an email can waste a lot of time and energy because it's impacting your mental health in a negative way. From previous conversations we've had, you know, and, and, you know, our experiences in the working world, I think this is a really huge prevalent factor. Okay. And, is that because we are not doing everything we can to address it or are, are we, you know, ignoring it or is it, is it actually just very, very hard to change? Why do you think we're still, um, you know, we haven't quite understood the root of workplace anxiety and therefore how to alleviate it? Yeah, I, I'm quite optimistic. I actually don't think it's as hard as people think it is to make meaningful change. Um, I think mental health has always been stigmatized. So that's a long history of that. And we're just kind of getting past some of the stigma. And again, here's where I think the pandemic has been helpful in that people are more willing to share experiences and come forward and talk about it. So we're just starting to talk about it. But we for as much as we don't know about the human brain, we, we know a lot of things. And so as soon as we recognize it's a problem, 
and people start to, first of all, get educated about their own brain and body and others around them, um, I think there are very small steps that you can take today to make significant change. I mentioned email. Um, one of the things in my book, I talk a lot about communication, and there's some very simple tweaks you can make to how you communicate either on email or a DM or Slack or something like that. Um, within a team to really improve the anxiety and stress level of the team. So I'm pretty optimistic. I think once people start talking about it and learn about it and are willing to, I guess, be curious and, and try different things, I actually think um, we can make change pretty quickly in our kind of standard, what I call like the traditional office culture. You touched upon your book there, Dr. Jenny, and I, for one, I'm incredibly excited to, to read it. I mean, can you Give us a little bit more insight into what to expect when reading this book. Yeah, sure. So I'm very excited about the book, too. Um, it's called Work Smart, Use Your Brain and Behavior to Master the Future of Work. And it is going to be, I think, for people who are either trying to figure out how to work hybrid or virtual, um, or maybe people who, who want to work in a different way for the first time, or people who are managing teams um, and trying to figure out how to be a good manager. Um, I think the book will be really helpful. It, it looks at, you know, how we're working and takes that brain and behavior lens to understand what are, what are the key elements to building a successful culture at work and some foundational steps around um, time management and communication. And then I have a big, section of the book on empathy and connectedness, because I think that's what people really are struggling with right now. And the time management and the communication are important, but it's really like that feeling of human connectedness. So I, I talk a lot about that. I, I have a little bit of science in the book, uh, a lot of, you know, kind of uh, information from other experts on work situations, and then kind of a little bit of a vision of the future. And then finally, there's a, a practical kind of toolkit that you can start to make some of these changes today. Wow. So it's really a, you know, tangible guidelines and real life experience and examples as to what we can do to, to improve things within the workspace. I mean, what, what would you say is your, you know, you want individuals to be their kind of key takeaway from reading this book? Um, I think the key takeaway is that um, the future of work is now kind of whether you like it or not, we're here. And you can make these small changes using this understanding of your own brain and behavior to make it a pos much more positive experience. Um, and you should feel inspired that you can take this material out with your teams and other people you work with and really get started on something that will make things feel a lot better for everybody right away. Well, as I mentioned, I can't wait. I can't wait to uh, to read my copy. Um so, Dr. Jenny, we talked earlier about mental health and the fact that the stigma is, it's still there, unfortunately, but it's not quite as strong as it was previously in the sense that there are more forums, the convers you know, there are more conversations taking place, which in itself is, you know, huge progress. Um, what do you think is still happening in terms of these conversations that's really not propelling the conversation as forward as, as, as quickly as we would like? Mm -hmm. Well, there's one thing that I think we can do now to really clarify our thinking so that we can move forward faster. And that is, um, you might hear the term behavioral health. Um, that's out there a lot in the media. People talk about behavioral health. And I think this term is, in my opinion, actually not helpful at this point. And the reason why is that, you know, in the past, there was so much stigma around mental health and, and other problems that to destigmatize it, this idea of behavioral health kind of became a, a, a popular idea to kind of reduce stigma and make it a little more comfortable to talk about. But in reality, behavioral health is kind of confusing because it lumps together a bunch of different things. So there are three different things that make up behavioral health. And I believe it's really helpful to actually separate them. So that when you're talking and having a conversation, um, you use the right terminology. So everybody is clear on like what you're talking about. So the, the three things are mental health, 
So mental health, I would say, is very similar to physical health, right? Like it's more the medical model of health and illness where you can have disorders like schizophrenia is a mental health disorder. Major depressive disorder is a mental health disorder. Um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is a mental health disorder. And, and that, you know, using kind of the, the more medical lens on that and how to treat those issues is, is the way I think is probably the most helpful for us right now. The second thing you have is um, health behaviors. So health behaviors, I mentioned in an earlier example, would be if you have a patient coming into the doctor's office and the doctor's like, you know, this medicine's going to save your life. I want you to take it. Um, and the patient's like, well, it's a little expensive. And, you know, my family doesn't think I should. And um, I can't eat this food if I take it. And, and so they don't actually take the medicine that might help them. It's because there are all these behaviors around their health whether it's culture from their family or their schedule or so health behavior talks about your behaviors that influence your health. Wow. So, so the dynamic in between, so the relationship between you and prioritizing your health or implementing steps needed for your health. Yeah. Like let's say for example, um, for me to be healthy, I need to sleep eight hours a night, let's say. And my spouse um, works late and they come home at 10 o'clock, but I have to get up for work at six o'clock. My, I might want to spend time with my spouse. So I stay up until midnight and then I don't get enough sleep. So my behavior has impacted my sleep, not because I'm just ignoring it, but because there's something else getting in the way, which is I want to spend time with my spouse. Right? So, so that's an example of a health behavior. And then the, the third thing is something called behavioral science. And that's more the psychology of why humans do all of the crazy, irrational things that we all do, right? And, you know, I think the most familiar example from tech is like online shopping, right? Like they have, uh, they have been very smart in using behavioral science to get us to buy things. So it's no coincidence that, you know, you can do a single swipe to purchase something, right? because that makes it much easier and tempting for a human to go buy something. Even though rationally we're like, oh, I don't know if I should buy that. Oh, well, I'll just, you know, it makes it so tempting. So that's a using behavioral science to get us to do what we want to do to achieve our goals. So the three things are actually really different. And I think by separating them out, when we talk about them, it makes it much clearer what we mean. And so in the workplace, you know, all three of those things could be important, but they're different. I've, I find this fascinating because you know, I'm quite guilty, I suppose, of, of, of myself, you know, grouping it together in terms of behavioral health, because that's what, that's the narrative that I'm, that I'm hearing, you know, it's not an excuse, but it's, it's more widely known and mm -hmm. adopted and utilized. Um, but actually, if someone was to ask me what's what is behavioral health, I think I would probably struggle somewhat in articulating that because, as you right. said, it encompasses so much. Um, but to actually understand, uh, I mean, you know, a little bit more about actually you can there are subdivisions with that makes the conversation somewhat easier because there's more clarity immediately by breaking that down. So that's so, so interesting. Um, thank you for sharing that with me. I'm, I'm definitely going to take that forward, um, you know, uh, uh, for, from today onwards. So, so thank you. Um, and why do you think that it's important that, you know, it, as businesses within the tech space or any industry, that we are comfortable in discussing the three as separate components? Well, it's really important. So if I were just to put on my business CEO hat, you know, it's really important because you have limited resources to help your employees. So for example, if my problem is, you know, my sleep problem because my spouse is coming home and like, I don't need to go to a psychiatrist, right? I don't need to go to a doctor, a medical doctor to tell me how to figure this out with my spouse so I get the sleep I need. So, so but you would overutilize very expensive resources like psychotherapists or psychiatrists or medical resources when maybe that's not the issue at all. Really, maybe it's just sitting down with like a coach to talk with you like, hey, you're not getting enough sleep. 
you know, let's think about what you could do with your spouse to make this work. So if you break them up as a business person, it will help you use the resources wisely. And it will also help um, make uh, your operations run more smoothly. So in other words, if you're thinking about why people aren't doing what they're supposed to in your, in your employees or your clients, if you go to behavioral science, that's going to have a really high impact. If you're seeing people struggling in your company with their mental health, then you need to focus more on, you know, medical things and, and the operations has nothing to do with it. So by clarifying it, you can say, okay, this is a health issue. I need to get medical attention. This is an operations issue. This is a coaching issue. And you can kind of use your resources much more efficiently and effectively. Dr. Jenny, why do you think the term behavioral health came about as opposed to being more specific from the outset? I think, well, first of all, I think there's very few people that actually understand the nuance. So I'll just say that first of all. I really don't think, you know, psychiatrists are trained to be psychiatrists, psychotherapists are trained to be psychotherapists, coaches are coaches. So um, I've had an unusual background and experience of doing multiple perspectives. And so for me, I can kind of see how it connects. But I think there's very few people that have that like, big picture. And I also think it's just easier to lump it together, because then businesses can say, oh, we're taking care of behavioral health, and then they can kind of delegate it to a behavioral health company, right? And, and I don't want to say offload responsibility exactly, but kind of carve it out so that they don't have to get into the weeds as much. So it's convenient by almost grouping it together. Yeah, yeah, I think it is. And 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 that's how it's been marketed to them. Like you said, Kieran, um, that's how you've heard about it. And that's how other companies are talking about it. And that's what they're getting pitches on. And so it's not for lack of wanting to do the right thing. It's just that's kind of how it's being talked about right now. Absolutely. And, and so I, I I think we've covered this already, but just to really cement the point, Dr. Jenny, moving forward, how, what changes would you like to see in terms of communication and language around this subject? I mean, I think I'd, I'd like to see people say, if, if they say, okay, we have an issue, it's a, it's a behavioral health issue. I'd like to say, okay, wait, let's slow down. Um, when we say we have a behavioral health issue, what are we actually saying? What is the actual issue we're facing? And try to clarify which of these three categories it's in, because then we can say, okay, I know this is a mental health issue. It needs more medical attention. So now I can focus on getting that set up. Or no, I have a behavioral science problem. My, my operations are not working with humans. And then you can kind of do that. So I'd like people to just kind of slow down and feel safe with one another to challenge assumptions and say like, well, we think this is what's going on, but let's, let's go a little deeper. Let's just take a moment, go a little bit deeper and be really clear about what we're, what we're seeing. And if we're not clear, let's go ask questions and get clear. So spend that extra time and energy. Cause again, you're going to waste a lot of time and energy down the road. If you don't just take a moment to really think about what you're talking about. And, and just to perhaps even extend that further, I think there is certainly a responsibility on business leaders to educate themselves in a, in a proactive way um, so that the language of the you know, narrative within a company is, it will transition um, so that it is more specific. But I think, you know, and, and I'm guilty of this, as I mentioned, why didn't I research it in more detail? Why did I just accept the term behavioral health even though I wasn't 100% clear as to what exactly that entailed, I thought I did. Um, and I, and, you know, I suppose that's a level of ignorance that I think many of us are guilty of. And only through proactive education can we address that. And, of course, as, as you, you have discussed, that the benefits of, are, are very clear um, individually as a, as a collective and also from a, a business strategy sense as you said, you, you, we would save so much time if we were able to you know, more efficiently identify what the actual issue is. Right. And I think the interesting thing for me that's perhaps a little bit more nuanced why you and I and so many people don't really 
take that time to really question is that it, it gets a little personal, right? Like I gave the example of when I was doing this weird behavior and not, I wasn't even aware of it. So it gets a little personal. You know, we have to admit that we're all human and we all have these psychological biases and assumptions. And so I think it, it maybe that's part of it too. It gets a little personal. You have to be able to be confident enough to say, yeah, I'm human. I make these mistakes just like I, I swipe on that purchase thing, just like all, you know, all of you do. And so I think maybe that's a little bit of a nuance there is that it gets a little personal and you have to be willing to kind of say, yeah, we're all human. We all do the same kinds of errors. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. And our employees aren't perfect either. Well, thank you. I think that's um, certainly lots of things there that can be, can be implemented right away. Um, so as mentioned earlier, Dr. Jenny, you're obviously a founding member of Chief, uh, highly uh, you know, regarded, many accolades. You know, you're an absolute <laughs> leader in this space. And one of the things that we've spoken about, and I know you're very passionate about, is the topic of women in leadership. And yes. so I was hoping, you know, we could talk a little bit about that. Um, and as more specifically, we talked about role models um, within yep. within uh, the female leadership sort of landscape. And could, could you just share with me, please, sort of your thoughts on that? Sure. And I've been doing some more research on this recently on this idea of mentoring for women. Um, I think this is one of the most interesting things I've seen along the way in the different leadership roles I've had or the people I've coached or organizations is that we're told as women and, and men and others to get mentors, right, to help us in our career. And what I have seen is that because uh, the world of business in particular, but also healthcare and other things has been um, male led, the mentors tend to be male. Or there is a very small number of female mentors, but because it's been so male led, there aren't a lot of different role models for women. So the, the scope of female leadership in the past was rather narrow. And so what I have seen is that women look for mentors and sometimes the role model mentoring that they're looking for can actually be detrimental because the leader they want to be that mold actually isn't out there yet. You know, they're creating a new path and a new way of being a leader. And so role models actually just don't even exist for them. Um, so I've seen that be really interesting, both for myself and for a lot of other women I've worked with. So would you say in some cases there was almost a, a sort of compromise, a, a sub, a, an unconscious co uh, compromise in terms of that role model figure because without realizing it, there, there is a, a disconnect due to the factors which you've outlined. Yeah. And there's a lot of women who have written about this and, and researched it, but, you know, for example, female leaders in the past tended to be either adapting to be very masculine kind of in their speech and in their behavior so that they could fit in, um, or women would tend to be kind of very likable, like a very likable woman character and and that would be respected but you know we've always walked that weird line between being likable and being assertive and and it's always been tricky and i think you see now there's like a lot of new female leadership out there that doesn't look like the old styles and there's more freedom to create that but there's not great role models and i know for for people of minorities as well as women like um, they're creating their own path and they're creating their own leadership style. And sometimes you just can't find a mentor to kind of be a role model and, and lead the way for you. Yeah. Or you find role models that perhaps you could, could look up to in this particular area, but they look very different or their, their background was very different or they come from a, you know, a very different family or, you know, um, upbringing. And so, <coughs> It's not a, and it's through no fault of their own, obviously, but it's not quite as holistic as perhaps you would ideally want. Um, I think that's certainly, you know, something that perhaps many of us have seen as well. So, Dr. Jenny, what would you suggest is, is you know, if, if you're a, a, a female within the, the 
business space at the moment and and you really do want that kind of support and nurturing and inspiration what's your advice to those individuals i think mentoring is great but clarifying with the person that's going to mentor you like what are the goals of the mentorship is it around a certain skill set you want to develop you know like being very clear about kind of what you're hoping to get out of it is one thing i think being open to mentorship from people who aren't like you, uh, whether that's, you know, if you're a woman, if that's a man, if it's a person from a different background, a person in a different functional part of a business. So if I'm in clinical leadership, getting mentorship from an operations leader, for example, like a different functional group. Um, and then, and then trying to figure a way to access the vision of the future you want for yourself. And, um, I, I, found a book that was very helpful called Playing Big by Tara Moore. And she has an online course. And like her concept is that you create a mentor for yourself, that you can visualize going and talking to your, the future version of yourself and, and say, what what do I need to do in this situation? And I, at first I was very skeptical of this exercise, but I actually have found that really helpful. Like this future version of yourself mentoring you now and so kind of seeing what where you want to go um so those are like a couple practical ways i think I that, go about that's it. a really yes sorry to I didn't mean to interrupt i mean that's such an in, uh, an interesting concept because we ha- we know the idea and you know we've heard the term be your own best friend yeah which obviously is not is, is not aimed at the workspace it's more of a you know a general holistic kind of approach but it's essentially to be quite self-reliant to to love yourself and to you know invest in yourself which I think is amazing um but to to view yourself and to build yourself up to be your own mentor I think is incredibly empowering um and really liberating but also that you're investing in yourself now and in the future and it kind of completely shifts the the power paradigm that we've we've and the construct that we've been brought up to believe um i i think i, I need to read that book sorry could you just tell yes, me sure. of that book again so please? the book is called playing big and the author is tara moore m-o-h-r and she also does a class online i think a couple times a year or once a year maybe um but this future version of yourself sometimes like has all this wisdom for you and you're like, well, how is, you know, that's in my brain somewhere. Like I just have to kind of figure out how to access it. And I've, I've found that to be really, um, to be really helpful actually. And I've had some mentors along the way that were great and some that were really detrimental to me. And on hindsight, you know, I can look back and say, yeah, some of them actually were not helpful at all. What key things would you like, um, women in in leadership to 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 really you know spread the word about at the moment in terms of let's say within the business space you know seeking out role models or seeking out coaches what advice would you give them well i think seeking out mentors is great but again i would say focus on the coaching aspect of it rather than the role model aspect of it um so that would be one thing so search coaches rather than role models Um, The other thing would be, I hope women really push themselves to think bigger and not think small. And that's kind of the premise of the book I was telling you about. But don't limit yourself. We have enough issues to kind of get past outside of us. Like, don't put boundaries on yourself unnecessarily. Um, And then the third thing would be, I really think people in leadership, not just women in leadership, um, but really focusing on equity in the leadership tier, whether that's gender equity, racial equity, socioeconomic equity, you know, I I think I really do believe that if we can get equity at the leadership level, it can pretty quickly start to translate into equity at other levels. It's harder, though, when the equity is all at the ground level and not at the top, I just think that slows us down. So I think um, opening the door, I've heard someone say, like, open the door for a sister. That's what Chief is all about. Like, (laughs) it's an amazing group of women. They're all VP or C-suite above. um, And the support and help that you get there in a non-competitive way is pretty tremendous. 
And that's why I'm a member. And I think there's many times you can open that door for somebody um, without it being too difficult on, on your end. So kind of open a door for a sister or somebody else maybe who, who needs a helping hand. Amazing. Thank you. I think that's, I mean, I could talk to you, Dr. Jenny, for, you know, for hours and hours. <laughs> um, but I think that is a really, really poignant place to, to, to wrap that up because I, I don't think you could, you know, anyone could have articulated it that any better. Um, and yes, I just think that's, um, you've given so many points that are high level, you know, things to think about, but also lots of clear, tangible steps that can be implemented today that will help businesses um, ensure that the, 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 there's cultural cohesion and you know, a forward-thinking mentality, which essentially will benefit everyone. Um, Dr. Jenny, thank you so much for your time. Uh, as always, it's, it's, a, it's a real pleasure. Um, I know we'll be you know, talking soon, but again, I'm really, really looking forward to the release of your book. Um, and just wanted to uh, just to say thank you again. Thank you.